Perfect. All right, now we're we're live on Facebook. Thank you again, Monica. But uh, all right, let's try this again. Uh, here we are for an, another awesome Palm Beach Tech Talk. Uh, we're uh, excited to have James from Scout Cybersecurity on with us today uh, as their director of marketing. Um, and uh, we're going to get right to his presentation. So going to be very brief as far as the uh, introduction here. Of course, this uh, event is all part of our mission to build South Florida into a tech hub. That's why we exist as an organization. That's what we do through all of our different events. I want to uh, take a moment to uh, introduce our sponsor uh, for the tech talk tonight. Uh, that is Kerry Stamp and Company. We actually have Kerry Stamp here with us. He is a uh, financial advisor based here in Palm Beach County, uh, but also is a tech startup founder himself. So Kerry, thank you so much for supporting the event and happy to hear a little bit more about what you do. Thanks, Joe. Uh, as a financial advisory firm, uh, we have nine financial advisors, offices here in South Florida, Stanford, Connecticut, in Chicago. Uh, we actually have clients and we're very good at doing the virtual uh, client work because we have clients in 27 different states. Uh, our average client's been with us for more than nine years. And last year we had a 98% retention rate uh, amongst our clientele. We help them with their investments, their asset management, their estate planning, their tax strategy, their insurance, and all of their other financial strategies. Whether you're just starting out or you're a near retiring uh, tech entrepreneur, we can help you. We have advisors that work with folks at all different levels. I love technology. I don't understand half of what you guys talk about, but I love working with tech folks. So thank you for letting me sponsor tonight. And I look forward to hearing a lot more about cybersecurity because I know how important it is. Well, that's one of the reasons we're on these uh, these calls and these events, carries is not because we know everything, but obviously to learn something about it. So uh, thank you so much, um, Carrie, for sponsoring. And of course, this event, as all of our events, is uh, a, a part of our uh, community creed is to wholeheartedly uh, welcome uh, everybody to uh, to our events. Uh, as we intend to build a welcoming, collaborative, and inclusive community for all. If you are interested in learning more about what we do with our community, you can go online to palmbeachtech.org. Also want to give a shout out to our members who uh, support our organization year round and also events like these. Some really awesome companies and some really awesome name brands there that you see. And if you're interested in becoming a part of uh, our membership, uh, either as an individual or as a corporation, you can go to palmbeachtech.org and click the membership button. We have a number of really awesome benefits and uh, ways we work with our companies and our um, community on a regular basis. Uh, and for those who are just looking to get more engaged and involved, we have an awesome series of events that we um, are actually going to take a break from for the holidays in a couple of weeks, but we're going to be right back in Adam in January for a lot of these really awesome events. So um, with that, I want to get right to James. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Uh, a former Boca Raton resident, now currently in New York City. Uh, I throw from the Empire State Building, I believe. Uh, but uh, Scout Cybersecurity has been a three-year uh, member of Palm Beach Tech and has been a really great uh, supporter of a lot of the things that we've been doing. And they built uh, what is known as uh, an, MSS, an MSSP, a managed uh, services security provider over the last uh, several years, really being at the cutting edge of some of the technology that helps uh, defend some of the uh, growing companies here in South Florida and companies all over the world from uh, the ever-growing list of bad actors out there. So uh, James, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Great. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm really happy that we have a, a pretty uh, diverse group of backgrounds on here today. So I think my presentation and, and demos that we'll get into sort of uh, fit for everyone. Um, so just to just to jump in here, I have a, a couple slides. Um, so today we're covering hacking demos and some security best practices. I think everyone can leave here um, with some, some things that you can do um, for yourself to keep yourself safe and protected. Um, and, you know, with that, I will get right into it. Let me just pull it up so I can see it on my side. Oops. 
moment here. All right. Uh, so my name is James Hassel, I'm the director of marketing at Scout. With saying that, I do have a more technical background than most directors of marketing. Um, so I just want to set the, the scene here, the cyber landscape. I think that this is important context when discussing anything cybersecurity. Um, as we move over the past 20, 21 years, um, you know, we started with just desktops, laptops, uh, 2G was, was fast. Um, hackers were really just using tools that were already out there. Um, you know, we, we usually refer to that as like script kitties, meaning people who just use scripts that are out there to hack. Um, and, you know, applications were just client server applications. Things were more simple. Uh, attacks were intrusive, but they didn't happen that much. Uh, they're mainly targeting uh, large enterprises. And then as we moved in um, through like 2007 and 2014, we had things start to change. You know, we're moving more mobile, um, eventually to the Internet of Things, uh, 3G and eventually to 4G. The amount of data um, just tremendously uh, increased from an exabyte uh, to zettabytes. Um, and, you know, we have like people moving from Facebook or like we, we moved from AIM in 2000, uh, in 2000 or other uh, messaging based communications to Facebook, Twitter. Now we have like TikTok and Instagram. But the hackers uh, and the hacking landscape has also changed as well. Um, and now uh, in, in 2021, it's no longer the Internet of Things. We call it the Internet of Everything, meaning everything's connected, <laughs> including it's not just smart lights anymore. It's, it's everything you could possibly imagine. Um, everything is uh, automated and there's actually been more data created in the past three years uh, than in the history of mankind, uh, which will always remain true uh, if we continue on the path that we're projecting. Um, so you just think about how crazy it is and how much data there is out there. Uh, we've also like our perimeter, uh, what we call it, like in security, we, we talk about the perimeter. Um, so it used to be, you know, you'd have like a, a computer system lockdown or like a network lockdown. Um, and then you, you move to like a, like firewalls and you, you lock down uh, like a network a corporate network and you want to keep people out of your corporate network. And then this sort of shifted to like hybrid cloud and in, in like the past five years um, where you have things that are on a cloud network and things that are internal. Um, and now, you know, like with Zoom work from home, we're all on our laptops. We don't have that corporate network. We don't have that firewall. So the perimeter is um, our cell, like our, our own computer. Um, and that's important context when we talk about the attacks and, and the new uh, attack surface and how to stay protected from it. Uh, in addition to that, attacks are I, just, just massive. Like the number of attacks has gone straight up. Uh, the destructiveness from attacks has gone straight up. Um, more data is getting leaked every day. Systems are getting locked out. It's, it's getting bad. And, and um, you know, before this started, we were talking about Amazon, AWS having their outage last week. Um, they, half of business applications are not <laughs> usable, um, you know, for a couple hours. And, and um, you know, we, I suspect very soon, um, and we're predicting at Scout that there will be some sort of cyber Armageddon in the next couple of years where something really, really, really bad happens um, on, on a scale and a caliber that we've not seen before. Um, you know, not just information getting leaked, but like think like a uh, major power system going out or something like that. Something like that will likely happen. I don't want to scare everyone, um, but that's like the direction that we're heading. Um, so um, we're, we're, now that, you know, it, with the context of uh, how things have changed, there's more data um, and more attack surfaces and the attacks are getting worse. Let's talk about attacks. They are typically similar. 99% of all attacks are similar. Um, and they usually, they're, they're attacking three different things. So in cybersecurity, we talk about CIA, um, the triad. Uh, the, the tri and it's a triangle. And whenever you're, you're working on information security, you're balancing confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. So uh, if something's highly confidential, it's less available because um, it, it's, it's harder to get to. Um, you know, the more you encrypt it, the more layers and passwords you have to type in to get access to it. So, so it's a balance between things. But we can also look about the, at these same concepts uh, from an attack perspective. So attacks are trying to do three different things. 
They're trying to steal your identity, um, execute something on your systems, or deny uh, or do some sort of denial of service attack. Um, and these identity-based attacks are like passwords, authentication bypass, things like that. Uh, execution is more malware, ransomware, uh, and denial of service, DDoS, attributed denial of service. Uh, and, and all attacks, every single attack or 99.9%, 99% of attacks can be categorized in um, you know, one of these areas or multiple of these areas. So it's not complicated. Like we're not, we're not doing anything new. We're doing the same things and we're just using different tactics to execute on them. Um, and this is, this is an overview of sort of how an attack works. So you have an attacker um, and they maybe send an email into someone on a corporate network um, and somebody clicks the email. So now we've targeted a system through email and a person has interacted with it and clicked it. Um, perhaps something has now executed or some malware has uh, executed and this hacker has now infected the endpoint or gained access to the endpoint or a, that computer. Uh, endpoint, when I say endpoint, I mean computer. Um, they'll then traverse the network or move throughout the network, look for other computers that they can attack. Uh, and many times if they find a server, they'll provision themselves credentials on that server um, and, and give themselves admin access to as much as possible. A key thing to note here is, is hacks uh, more often than not um, are not happening like all in one day. They're happening over the course of a couple months. Um, so the average time for businesses to detect uh, a, some sort of breach is typically about 297 days, I think it is now. It's changed the Verizon data breach report, uh, reports on it every year, and it's usually around the same, around 300 days. Um, so hackers are, are, are waiting and they're, they're gaining you know, as much information as they can and giving themselves more and more access. So they'll then you know, go back now that they've got the network uh, figured out, they've got their own access and they'll you know, provision everything. And, and that's when they'll start to take on other people's identity uh, or you know, provision their own identities. And they're, they're you know, impersonating someone, impersonating the CEO maybe, um, taking their logins. Uh, and that, once they have that, they can start taking um, assets like data um, or uh, hurting their brand um, or, you know, hacking personal accounts. And they'll take all of that information, whether it's credit card information. I know we said someone on here is in PCI compliance, um, healthcare records, um, IP, intellectual property, um, your code base, um, your whatever it is, whatever data it is that you care about they're usually uh, selling it on the dark web uh, is typically you know, where this all goes. Um, so it, it, when we look at attacks, we call things, uh, we, we, we refer to the cyber kill, kill chain in cybersecurity. I know that there are some security architects on the call uh, or people more uh, familiar with cyber. Uh, they're probably very familiar with the kill chain. Um, you know, we have a simplified, uh, like the kill chain is an industry description of like an attacker's methodologies. So what I have is a simplified version of the kill chain. So hackers will typically do three things. They'll get in, look around, and they'll act. And they're usually getting in through email, open RDP, which is remote desktop protocol, uh, or a bug in an application or an unpatched application. They use automation um, and you know, scripts, really, uh, whatever toolkits that are already uh, open, that they, you know, open source, uh, to look around and find vulnerabilities. And then they'll uh, steal data or encrypt and ransom information. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I'd like to cover some of the biggest threats that we see in SMBs today. Um, business email compromise is huge. Um, basically, what business email compromise is exactly how it sounds. What would happen to you and your business? How much data could someone cause if they had full access to your email account? Think of how many times that you've sent private information. Think of what you can get a client uh, to do by sending them an email. The damage that someone can cause with access to your email is massive, 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 massive. I know we all like to pretend that we don't you know, send scanned documents with our social security numbers on it um, or our checking account information, but more often than not, people have this stuff in their email. Uh, if you really think about it, you, you may have even done it yourself. Um, you know, you need to get something sent in by the end of the day. Someone needs to pay you. you. You send your routing information, whatever it is. Um, if you collect money over email or someone in your organization collects money over email, uh, their email account being uh, compromised 
the, the damages that someone can cause are huge. Um, and then ransomware is something that we're probably all familiar with. It's when you look at a computer and it has a big screen on it that says, pay me this amount of Bitcoin uh, or else we're going to delete all your data. Um, so this is a, a, a big problem that is happening to small and medium sized businesses. Um, and then moving to the cloud as well. So as we've, you know, the, the COVID's definitely accelerated a lot of the trends that were already happened, um, including the moving to the cloud. So um, cloud security, I, I just want to point out one thing, is usually the user's fault. Um, and what I mean by that is if a system ha breach happens because an AWS server was quote unquote hacked or accessed, 95% of the time, according to Gartner, it is the person who installed the server's fault, not the hosting company. So it is an unpatched server or a system in the cloud. And, and you know, and I think that's an important distinction because it's, it's important to have, you know, good, good IT teams and, and good cyber hygiene with you and make, making sure you're patching things and setting things up for it and access control. But today I'm going to talk uh, specifically about business email compromise. Um, so I, I, I have a couple demos that I want to go through. Um, the first is, is targeting users with uh, open source intelligence. Um, so basically hackers, when people think of hackers, they'll often think things are very complicated um, or that you know they're doing some magic stuff, but really it's, it's not that difficult. Um, so you can, you can probably, if you have kids, they're probably very good at this, but you can find a lot about a person um, online. So through their Facebook, their Instagram, their LinkedIn, their uh, DNS records, um, information that's leaked from the dark web, you might be able to find their passwords, uh, all of this stuff that's, that's normal. You can, even, you can even put in Google search queries for common server um, log file names that contain passwords and find unpatched servers that are easy um, to access and, and find uh, you know, the server password. So a lot of hacking is just using tools that we use legitimately every day. Um, so I am going to stop sharing for a second, flip over here, um, and put my screen up. Um, so what I have open is the open source intelligence framework. And what it is, is um, just a, a set of tools, anyone can access this on, online, um, to, to find information about someone. So what I'm gonna do is, is demo how you can find information about a person, find their email address uh, to target them with a business email compromise or phishing campaign. So I can go in, like just clicking around here, like I can go on social networks, find stuff about people. I can go, uh, I'm, I'm specifically looking at email addresses right now. So I can go in and, and look uh, for people's emails using these many different tools. Um, so to demo right now, I'm going to open the email permutator, which basically is just an open source tool. It's probably like 20 lines of code. You can make it yourself, um, which creates basic uh, versions of business emails. So I'm using this to guess someone's email address. So I'm going to type in Brendan Jackson at tryoutscout.com is a, is a uh, account that we use for demo purposes. Um, and if you look here, you'll probably see the email format that you use at your business. Um, it, you know, I, we use that scout. Mine is jimmy at getscout.com. You can email me at that. So first name at website.com. Um, and, um, you know, so, so it's, it's very common. So it's not that hard for hackers to find someone's email address if it's not out there already. Um, so what I can do is I can actually take um, an email address and I can see if the email actually exists in the system uh, just by using an email verification tool, uh, basically what the tool does, and there's a bunch here uh, that you know are open open for anyone to use and free to use. What this tool does is start sending someone uh, an email. So it, it starts sending them an email, sees if they um, you know if the server communicates with them, and that's how it can tell if it's a real email or not. So we do first name dot last name. Uh, the email does not work. Uh, so let's try first name only. And we'll do first name at domain.com. And we can see uh, that that is the actual um, email for this company, uh, for this person. 
So, I, you know, that's just the first uh, demo that I wanted to go through that just shows how easy it is to actually access um, someone's information um, or get their email address to start targeting them with phishing emails. Um, if people like cold email you, this might be how they got your information if you're not in like Zoom info or some database like that. Um, so just a couple, while we're on the subject of email, like I'd like to talk about a couple email security tips um, for your personal and business accounts. You should always use multi-factor authentication uh, and strong passwords. You should use, if you're, if you're sending um, health information or other private information over email, you should use email encryption. Um, you might need to buy uh, in email encryption software, or if you have a certain license on Microsoft uh, Office 365, you can actually just type encrypt in the subject line. I believe you need to actually enable that, uh, but it's, it's pretty uh, simple uh, to do and very useful. Um, you should implement some sort of phishing protection software. Um, so the standard spam filters for businesses is typically um, not good enough and isn't gonna catch all phishing. Uh, attack. So you should use some sort of phishing protection software. Uh, and then you should continuously train users on security. So um, if you are running a business or part of a business, you always want to make sure that um, some sort of security awareness training is happening. Uh, there's also something called DMARC, which is a combination of SPF and DKIM, um, which basically it, it, in, it verif it, email was set up inherently insecure. Um, so SPF and DKIM were created um, to check one if a uh, the person who's sending the email is legitimate, um, or and two if um, the email that you're receiving is from a legitimate sender. Um, so you can you can actually go to that website domain checker dot just Google uh, DMARC checker and you'll be able to see if your domain is set up for that. Um, and then some. A couple of quick tips on phishing. Um, don't click links or attachments. I know it seems pretty basic, but you know, just be very careful of that. Um, you should always check the from. Like I've gotten a couple Black Friday phishing emails that were from Amazon, um, and it wasn't actually from Amazon. It was just uh, from um, like someone who listed their first name on the email provider as Amazon, so it showed up like that in my Yahoo Mail, which has pretty for phishing protection, I think. Um, looking for like pixelated images or poor spelling grammar. This is something a little less relevant now because uh, phishing attacks are getting better, uh, but it's definitely a telltale sign of a phishing attack is pixelated images um, or like misspellings. Um, and then, you know, if, if you're not sure if something's legitimate or not, you should uh, call someone and verify over phone or um, text message or whatever over a second medium. Uh, and of course, get layers of protection. So if something does happen, you do get fish, you wanna make sure you have good endpoint protection or antivirus on your computer to prevent it from being a major problem. Um, so I'm actually gonna show you guys how hackers execute a phishing attack. Uh, this is a basic phishing attack using a open source tool called Zfisher. It's re readily available. You could download it and have it spun up in a couple minutes. Um, but what I'm gonna do is host a um, phishing, web show you how to host a phishing website uh, on your own computer, port forward the information, uh, and then harvest someone's credentials. So give me a second here, I will load it up. Is this tool is one of the features terrible English? Um, it is, it is not, uh, you have to add that yourself, the terrible English yourself. Um, okay. So, um, now that I have this open up, um, you can see the, the Z Fisher actually lets you select, like it, it, it builds phishing pages for you. It basically automates it. So you can go to any website. And you can press um, inspect source or view page source and save it as an HTML file or save as page and then complete HTML. And you can have a local copy of the page. So you can very easily impersonate common pages like Facebook. Um, but what I'm gonna do is set up a Microsoft uh, impersonation. So first is just selecting a uh, local hosting provider. 
Um, these are services that just like port forward uh, information. Um, and then I'll launch the service using number four, which is Microsoft. Um, so now I have this URL. Uh, if you really wanted to, you could spin up a, um, you could spin up a, another URL, like a, like a domain that's like Microsoft, or um, like you could do Microsoft dot um, whatever business dot com um, with like one misspelling in it or something. Um, and so it'll put the phishing link in there um, because, and I'll send out this uh, this fake phishing email. So now on the other end, I have a office account um, that is receiving the email. So this is what it looks like when it comes in, you know, like if you are uh, moving fast or you're on your phone or something, you might not notice. You can see that this is from an AOL email account, um, but it's actually showing up as Microsoft Security Alert because the person just set the name to Microsoft Security Alert. Um, so when you click verify your identity, at the top, you'll see that the um, domain name is completely off. Um, it's, you know, that that local, um, you know, that forwarded uh, host that I that I set up, that domain that I set up, but the page looks like the legitimate Microsoft sign-in. So when I go to sign in here uh, on the victim, the information is actually sent and I can see the password uh, in plain text sent over, I actually have the victim's IP address um, and I've saved it, the information. And, and what that actually does on the other side when you're a client is it's gonna forward you to the wrong password um, and have you, like it says like wrong password, type it in again. So you just go and type your password in again because you thought you put in a typo um, and, it, and then log in legitimately and you don't even know what happened. But now I have the um, email address, um, which I you know got before through uh, the, the open source intelligence. And I now have the password because I just fished the password from them. So I can go ahead and, and log in the account um, and what hackers usually do when they log in the account, uh, you know, like I said, they don't make themselves known immediately. So um, they usually wait around and see what they can find. So uh, what, what we see it at Scout in our security operations center all the time is hackers will get into um, an account and they'll set up email forwarding rules. Uh, so basically it's a legitimate Microsoft tool. You might've used it yourself before. It says any email that comes in containing this text uh, or is from this person, forward it to this other address. Um, so again, this is like a tool that, that you might use normally, uh, but hackers use this to siphon out information. So I'll, I'll go and add a rule um, and I'll call it like admin or something. Um, so, you know, cause people might not think like, oh, it's just admin rule. Like the, the IT guy probably set this up, you know, I don't really know. Um, and then, let's say I look through the account and I see information like there's this person's an accounts payable and they're doing lots of wire transfers. So any email that with the subject line wire transfer, I'll have it sent um, to my uh, hacker account. Now, because I changed the name to Microsoft security account, um, it actually shows up in the rule as Microsoft account. So this is like lab mill 20 uh, and, I, and, and I select it and it's saying, uh, forward to Microsoft account security alert. So if I'm just like a user and I'm not really paying attention, this might not look suspicious at all. Um, but watch what happens when an email is actually sent in um, to this account um, with the subject line wire transfer. So let's say, you know, it comes in, it's got the instructions, blah, 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 blah. Um, if I go back to the AOL mail uh, of my hacker box, I can actually see that the uh, email was sent over uh, to my account, and I now have that information. And you know, this is just one example. There's lots of other versions of it. There's versions where people have multi-factor authentication, and it'll actually have someone type in the code on the hacking site. Um, so, like, say I'm a hacker, I just have someone waiting in a room. Somebody types in their phishing information, and then they feel like, oh, okay, and then they just wait for the person to type in the code and submit it to the phishing website, and then they'll type in the code. Um, so like hackers are very sophisticated. They're changing things very very uh, often. We've also seen attacks where hackers will make legitimate Microsoft um, accounts or, or store their phishing pages in the Azure blob storage. Um, so it's bypassing, it's looking more and more like a legitimate Microsoft account. Um, and um, 
I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that this just goes to show, you know, no matter what your, your technical acumen or how familiar you are with security, how easy it is um, for hackers to actually do something like this. So I know we only have a couple minutes left, but um, I wanted to just cover one thing because I think this is really important uh, and it's actionable advice that you can share with your colleagues. Uh, one massive, um, like the, the hacking that happens is business email compromise. But what we hear in the news or what it get, goes down when somebody calls the FBI or when our security operations center calls the FBI is fraudulent wire transfers. So if you, um, you know, are, are work with an accounts payable or accounts receivable department, uh, you should put in um, or, or have them put in uh, some other controls for wire transfers. Uh, definitely do multi confirmations. You shouldn't ever have just one person uh, approving wire transfers. There should always be another person involved with it. Um, look out for urgency. You know, someone saying, hey, hey, they've hacked like their boss's email. And they're saying, hey, we need to buy this property right away. You know, we need to close it by the end of the day. I, I don't want you to leave the office till you do it. That's how these things have happened. We've seen businesses um, call us where their third parties have been hacked and their, part, their companies that they're working with um, are victims of business email compromise and they're telling them to pay um, certain and, and the money uh, is fraudulent and we've seen unrecoverable funds. We've managed to trace down funds up, up through millions of dollars. Uh, we've seen large purchase orders being routed to other countries. Um, these are things like, I've watched people build their businesses for 20, 30 years and then watch it um, take a massive hit um, in a day because millions of dollars are siphoned out um, due to business email compromise uh, and they, you know, they need to recover from that. And, you know, I, I say in a day, but really these are things that go unnoticed for a while. So I, I, I urge you if there's, if there's, Besides the technical things you can do and the cyber hygiene you can follow or getting you know, good endpoint protection or good phishing protection, put in some physical um, uh, uh, policies and procedures in, in place to protect against uh, wire fraud. So I'll wrap up with one thing. There's, there's five things that we typically recommend. People always ask us, what are your recommendations for cybersecurity? So for small and medium-sized businesses, we always tell people to figure out what data it is that they actually care about and protect that. Um, so people will make a mistake of protecting, um, you know, one certain system with it when they actually care about is their code base and their IP um, or their, uh, you know, it's important to actually verbalize what you actually care about and then build concentric rings of security. So like in, un we talked about an onion layered approach to security. You wanna build that security around the data that you actually care about once you've decided what it actually is. And then you need to know, you need to have a way to figure out if you have a problem. So these security attacks are going unnoticed for upwards of a year. Um, the faster you can uh, detect when a problem happens or when a security incident actually happens um, is, is the difference of it being a big public problem, um, like a ransomware attack or something you see in the news uh, or something that is manageable um, that has, you know, smaller side effects. And uh, if you don't know where to start, you should pick a framework for security. We typically recommend uh, NIST, which is a, a great uh, a framework um, or, um, and, and basically you don't need to do everything at once. Security is a journey, not a destination. Um, so if you have a framework, you can actually have something you can point to and say, you know, if you, if you were to get hacked and say, you know, we were following this, framework, which is recommended by the federal government and gives you your own protection. Similar to the way uh, accountants have gap accounting, you know, they say these are our projected, you know, revenue or this is our revenue and everything based on gap accounting standards. You can say these are the protections we put in place based on uh, the NIST standard. Um, so with that, I mean, what we do at Scout is, is uh, you know, we, we protect people uh, from cybersecurity. We work with MSPs uh, mostly. Um, so managed service providers, I saw that there was uh, someone on here earlier, uh, Mike, I believe, uh, who's an MSP. So you know, hopefully we can, we can chat, uh, but I'll, I'll wrap things up just at 632. Uh, don't want to take up too much of your time, but happy to answer any questions that uh, anyone might have.
Yeah, James, that was fantastic. Thanks so much for that. Um, Joe had to run, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up for us. But we're we're over time. But if anybody's got a last, you know, a question or two for for James, I'm happy to to take an extra minute. Eric, you just came off mute. I'm assuming you want to ask questions. I mean, it's it's more of just an observation. It sounds like security is more people messing up protocol, or it's always going to, you know, 95 percent of the time, what you said, it, it it's a people user error and falling for that stipulation that's put ahead. So it's more of like making sure that people are aware compared to the software or anything along those lines. And that's really where security needs to start. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can protect the system all you want, but somebody still clicks a button or turns it off, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that has opened my eyes in security. It's, it's, it's mainly user error compared to like the firewall, not, you know, doing what it's supposed to do or anything along those lines. So when like you think security, you always think of that side, but it, it's generally that somebody lets them through compared to them breaking their way in. But, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I... And, and it's the responsibility of us as businesses or cybersecurity or IT providers or people to educate uh, people in, in the business to prevent that from happening. So you can, you can do all the technical stuff you want, but if you're not teaching your people how to protect themselves from security, you're, you know, you're, you're missing the most important part. I guess my question is like, what one thing would you try to implement into somebody's like a normal employee's day to day to, to get the security heightened on that side? He says, uh, I would down, say right? <laughs> um, multi-factor authentication and, um, password usage so yeah so just the simple things like you were saying throughout this entire process it's just keep it simple yeah you know you can solve um like 90 percent of uh secure or 80 percent of security problems with 20 percent of the effort and budget you know the 80 20 rule applies here as well like basic cyber hygiene good endpoint protection antivirus good phishing protection, the two lowest cost products to protect yourself uh, and training, annual training for your employees is going to protect you from most things. Um, you have to do the other things too, especially if you want to protect everything. But if you don't have a good foundation in those uh, three areas, you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Thanks, James. My pleasure. Yeah, this was fantastic. I, I, I'm just looking at some of the comments like, Murray and Dennis both were raving about what a great review this was in such a short amount of time. And I have to agree. I, I think this was one of the best uh, cybersecurity presentations and great overviews. So thanks so much, James, for doing this. And um, Nikki put the, the, um, the link in, sla in, the, in the chat to getscout.com. So everybody go check it out. Um, James, any last, uh, last thoughts before we sign out? Uh, no, just if you have any questions or need help, don't hesitate to reach out. Well, thanks so much, James. Really appreciate it. And, uh, I've been dodging some bullets myself lately. So it was definitely an on point, on point presentation. And we thank you. And, uh, I'll probably be in touch with you soon. <laughs> great. Thanks. Have a great night, everybody. And, uh, and happy holidays. Thanks. See you, everyone. Happy holidays.